Welcome to Cradle and All, a podcast hosted by sisters Renita and Christine to educate, inspire, and connect with other mothers. Every other week, listen as we discuss topics related to pregnancy, raising children, and balancing motherhood with other aspects of womanhood. Whether you're relaxing, juggling tasks, or even breast pumping, join us as we figure it out together. Hi, you guys. Welcome back to another episode of Cradle and All. This is your host, Renita. And Christine. And we are so excited to welcome another guest on the podcast. Today, we're talking all about recovery after having a baby, postpartum body and mental recovery. But we are so glad to have Dr. Jessica Thompson with us, a pelvic floor physical therapist right here in Atlanta. So she'll join us in this conversation as we get into all of this today. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And we're happy to have you because we have both had children. And I think every living person most likely several of us have a pelvic floor. So we want to know, I think the first question is, what is a pelvic floor? You know, okay. you know, like we all went through anatomy, but I don't know if everyone is aware of what that is. <laughs> Listen, I know I did not ask school, let me tell you that. Um, but your pelvic floor is basically a group of muscles at the bottom of your pelvis is really the base of your core system. Okay, so there's three different layers of your pelvic floor. That first layer is the one that is really involved in arousal. So you have muscles in the first layer that really help your if we're talking to women here on this podcast, those muscles really help to kind of help your clitoris be erect and brings blood to your clitoris so it helps with your sexual function then there are also muscles in that first layer that kind of help close your anus so if you don't want to poop you don't poop and (laughs) you kind of keep things tight when you want to and when you want to poop you let it go um the second layer of your pelvic floor is more so involved in urination so those are the muscles that kind of help stop the flow of urine um, and also the muscles that kind of help close your vagina. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third layer, those are like the, the major players of your pelvic floor. Those are the big, the bigger muscles and they really help support all of the organs in your pelvis. And so if we're talking about ladies, we're talking about your, um, bladder, your uterus and your rectum. Okay, man. So tell us a little bit about what a pelvic floor physical therapist does, but specifically before you get into that, how did you get into this career field? I have to try to make this short because I (laughs) I love this story so much. Um, Okay, so I got into PT before PT school after undergrad, I took a year off to apply to PT school because that's like a job. Um, And I worked as an aide. So I was like answering the phone and like cleaning up in a pelvic floor PT office. And I did not get get that job on purpose. I had no idea what a pelvic floor PT was. I just knew I wanted to be a PT. But I really got to see um, a lot of people's lives be transformed. And I got to talk to people when they were inquiring about what is this, what to expect. So I heard these like nervous people on the phone and I saw them on the first day in the office, um, just being afraid of not knowing what to expect, right? Because that's the intimate part of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And then I could see them discharged and be just like, just new people telling everybody about it. And Also, while I was there, I really saw a lot of people had difficulty with coming into PT because there were not enough pelvic PTs around. So the access to care was very difficult for a lot of people and especially moms because they will hold that guilt of taking the time to go to see a pelvic PT when they could be caring for their baby or their husband Mm. or just working their job, right? And I I decided then before PT school um, that I would be a pelvic PT and that I would just open a practice with the mindset of optimizing care for women. So I'm just in that journey. Well, Jessica, I really love what you were saying about how you wanted to make people feel comfortable about 
issues with their pelvic floor and being evaluated. Cause sometimes I feel like when I see patients in the office talking about many of the issues that they experience where I recommend pelvic floor physical therapy, there's such intimate things. So people are really nervous about it and then don't even know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what are some of the common reasons that women who've had children may come to see you, whether they've had a vaginal birth or a C-section? Yeah, a, a lot of women deal with leaking urine after they have babies, and some of them deal with leaking um, feces or poop. And that's usually those who have had like grade three, grade four tears when they deliver, um, or like, like episiotomies and um, bad scarring and things like that. But um, leaking is a common issue pain with intercourse is a big one that people really don't want to tell you about um but it's a thing and even Mm -hmm. though these things are common they're not normal and that's what I really like to emphasize and it shouldn't be any shame in these issues because I don't know a woman who has had a baby who has not had some type of pelvic floor implication or even if it was for a short time, right? So no one should feel alone or broken or ashamed about having these issues with leaking when they call for sneeze or run or jump or, you know, not really enjoying intercourse or not being able to have intercourse because of pain. Um, Some people even have this, this heaviness in their pelvis or in their vagina that they don't understand um and a lot of times that's just because of weakness in that deep pelvic floor and those um, pelvic organs are kind of pressing down into the vaginal wall back pain is another common thing Hmm. yeah that's really interesting because I remember um when I had my children after each child, you know, you go back for your follow-up appointment and they tell you about some next steps about, you can see a pelvic pelvic floor therapist and some other things. And I always wondered what a pelvic floor therapist did. I just imagined it'd be similar to like physical therapy with another organ or another part of your body where you're like repeatedly working on it. And so can you tell us like, what is a pelvic floor therapist like what does a pelvic floor therapist do yeah so if you have been to PT for like your shoulder or your knee it's very similar when you come in for a visit there's paperwork that you fill out and then we always do an interview with our patients because how they describe their symptoms really gives us a clue of what's going on so I mean that's just the same we're just talking about a different set of muscles and a different part of your body and different types of symptoms but um and then we screen the body right we don't usually ever just zone into your vagina or your Mm -hmm. anus or your pelvic floor it's really that whole core system especially for moms because it's been so it's been changed so much because of um, carrying a baby for nine months Mm -hmm. and so we're looking at abdominal strength and we're looking to see the integrity of those muscles after being kind of separated for a long time as your belly grew when you were pregnant we're looking at your diaphragm and we're looking at your ribs so your diaphragm kind of goes up and your ribs kind of flare out when you're holding the baby in that extra space in your belly and Mm. it takes time to strengthen and to improve your posture to be back to where it was before the baby we're looking at your spine really closely because back pain is huge among moms and sometimes if it's not during pregnancy it is because of um carrying a baby physically carrying a baby um Mm -hmm. breastfeeding feeding the baby and just posture said mom moms have to do throughout the day carrying car seats bending over to clean things or to pick a baby up out of a crib oh my goodness nursing all the things you never think about all the positions that you will hold your body in when you're trying to care for a baby yeah (laughs) so like awkward positions have you ever I mean well y'all know I don't have a baby but those car seats weigh a ton yes oh, they yes. do they're so heavy and we still carry them and all the different holds don't change the weight of that car seat <laughs> <laughs> I know and that's the funniest meme I think is the one when you know you get discharged from the hospital 
hospital from having the baby and they say, mm-hmm. oh, don't lift more than 10 pounds. <laughs> and yes. it's like the car seat is like 40 pounds. Like, <laughs> And you're at the so doctor crazy. two days later. Yep. Right. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what mm-hmm. do you do? So yeah, we're looking at all of these things. And then usually, at least for me, towards the middle of the session, the first session, that's when I was zoned into your pelvic floor. And I usually don't do internal pelvic floor exams for um, postpartum women until after their six week follow up. Um, and once that OB is okay with it, then I'll do an internal exam. And we don't use like instruments, like when you get a pap smear, we use our index finger and we just insert it kind of one finger indentation if you look at your finger right and at each layer we're assessing the tone of those muscles as well as pain um the scariest part that people probably mm-hmm. wanted to know but it's really mm-hmm. not that bad I'm so glad that you touched on the fact that you know a lot of women just don't talk about this they think that some of the things that they're dealing with they're dealing with alone because I think Women will sometimes know that things will be different in how they feel after a baby's born, but they can't always distinguish what's different and what is abnormal. So for example, back Mm -hmm. pain and pelvic pain, for example, you may feel like you're just sore after delivery, but knowing, okay, is this sore is this sort of something that I need to just live with, or is this going to be something I need to do about it? Or Mm -hmm. even the things like leakage, as you talked about, or pain with sex, like sometimes people just are afraid to have those kind of conversations. So I love that there's an avenue to really go to and work with your provider and work with a pelvic floor physical therapy to help with some of these things. Now, even outside of having a baby, there are reasons that people come to see you all the time. What are some non-pregnancy related reasons that somebody may come to see a pelvic floor physical therapist? The big one is, would be pain. Um, and sometimes it is pain with intercourse and pain with intercourse could be that pain with penetration, but sometimes it's just overly sensitive nerve nerves. I guess it's the easiest way for me to say it in the pelvic floor. And, you know, it can just be touched down there is this pain by their body so that's a huge one that people come for it's just pelvic pain or some people might be like a biker or like going crazy on their peloton because that's really big now and now they have this tailbone pain that they can't get rid of um so they may want to see a, a pelvic pt and they may not need internal pelvic floor work i think that's important for me to say that everybody doesn't have that internal exam with that one glove and lubricated finger and nobody gets it if they don't want it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But you know, your pelvis is, is huge joint and there's a lot that we can do externally. So um, pelvic pain can be internal or external. I think that's my point. So for sure, those people who sit a lot for work, or like I said, those avid bikers, um, the pain with intercourse, of course. Some people have issues with incontinence and they've never had a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see those too. So, you know, mm-hmm. you did say, um, Dr. Thompson, about about like the different pains that people may experience the reasons for their visit, but how, what types of techniques or what would, can somebody expect when they're visiting you? How would they heal and repair those, um, the areas that need repair, like what is an example? Cause for me, I'm still like, Hmm, what does this really look like? <laughs> How are they getting care? Um, let's give an example. Let's say okay. somebody like, let's think from my experiences. So after I had a baby, I experienced some pain when like using the restroom, let's say like just common, like I had a vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. and had discomfort when using the restroom it went away on its own but if I were to visit you for having that issue what type of what type of care would I receive Uh, that's a good question would you say that the pain was with peeing or pooping or both both okay so the examination will be kind of like what I mentioned. And then usually, I mean, it kind of depends on what I see, but if you're postpartum, 
it may be more so related to your posture and breathing mechanics. So just the way that your body is able to manage abdominal pressure. So treatment would look like us making sure that you know how to contract and relax. Then it may be like looking to see scar tissue related to maybe some tearing that you had during delivery and seeing if that immobility is causing some pain or seeing if the immobility is impacting on some nerves that's causing some pain. And so I would probably address that scar tissue manually, meaning I would probably use my hands or some type of instrument to work on um, that tissue. And so that might look like like you're in a private room and you're undressed from the waist down, you're draped with the sheet and I'm using my manual techniques to help with those tissues. Um, and then it would be probably some strengthening, right? So it, it may include some pelvic floor strengthening, but it may also include some glute strengthening and some abdominal strengthening. So again, to make sure that your body is able to manage those pressures and that you're able to kind of breathe and bear down when you poop um, versus um, kind of holding your breath and straining. Wow. I was not expecting that. I was, when you said breathing and posture, I was like, you should have seen my face. I was shocked that, <laughs> that you said that I was not expecting that at all, but that is, thank you so much for explaining that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for somebody like me who sees women at their postpartum visits, mm-hmm. who are the ideal candidates to send to a pelvic floor physical therapist or somebody that should be coming to see you? Honestly, I feel like I send more and more women there um, who have some of the things that you talked about, but are there par- patients that you would say really sh- should be coming to see you to prevent further issues down the line? Or if yeah. they're having any specific issues right now, they definitely need to be in your office. Yeah, I would say every woman. And this is why, <laughs> because <laughs> I I am all, Dr. White, I am in this preventative care state, okay? And I think in our country, we're like behind on that. And it might have something to do with insurance and how we have to prove why we see people. We can talk about this another day, another <laughs> time. But um, I think all pregnant women, all postpartum women would benefit from seeing a pelvic floor therapist simply and if they're not having symptoms like you mentioned just for education so much of what we do as pelvic therapists is us talking and us educating and using models and helping to just retrain our bodies um because they have changed so much and we want to gradually get our bodies back into our you know our best shape after we have babies and Pelvic PTs are just equipped enough to know what is too much for your core system after a baby and, you know, really treat people individually. So I say every woman because there's so much education we can do to prevent them having to go back to see you and be referred to pelvic PT on down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about like preemptively? So if a mom knows that she's, you know, of course she's pregnant, she's expecting to give birth, mm-hmm. even if, it, and she may be having a C-section or a vaginal delivery. Is there anything that a mother can do to preemptively prepare her pelvic floor for giving birth and also the healing process? Sure. Um, one of the my favorite things to do is to help women prepare their pelvic floor for birth. And that usually looks like a lot of education, a lot Mm -hmm. of going on breathing, going over breathing, because some women think that their pelvic floor muscles push their baby out during delivery and they don't. (laughs) It's your uterus. It's literally nothing Mm -hmm. you can do. The uterus is in control. It's involuntary what you have to learn to do is you have to learn how to relax your pelvic floor muscles Mm -hmm. despite that pain so those muscles can really get out of the way (laughs) during birth (laughs) so your uterus can do its thing and then baby can come on down um so we so some people will come to me and say I want to get my pelvic floor ready for birth I know it needs to be stronger I need to do so many more kegels and I'm like "Mm -hmm." Well, it's good to have a strong pelvic floor, but for birth, let's focus on relaxing those muscles. Let's focus on restoring the length of those muscles so they can really be able to stretch and get out of the way 
for delivery. And so that's, we do that by working on different breathing techniques. We do that by doing different um, stretches for your hips and for your pelvis. Um, And then we also like to focus on the perineum. So that space between your vagina and your anus. And for some folks, it's really not that big of a space, Um, (laughs) but it has to stretch a lot. And so doing some of that perineal stretching, um, at least when you um, research is showing around 32, 34 weeks, can just decrease your risk of tearing or the grade of that tearing postpartum. So that's huge. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just a lot of education that way on breathing and stretching and lengthening. Yeah, that's great. So sometimes people make this assumption that your pelvic floor doesn't matter if you are going to have a C-section or if you've had a C-section, but obviously we know that a lot of changes happen in the body, especially the pelvic floor in pregnancy. Can For those women who maybe are going to have a C-section or who've had one, can you talk about how maybe they may experience experience some issues in their pelvic floor, um, even if they didn't have a vaginal birth? Yeah. Yeah. Um... And if, and let me go back, because I know you asked that earlier. So if we were prepared for birth and you had to, you knew that you had to have a C-section for whatever reason. So we would kind of work on the same thing. And that's, that's because, you know, we don't know how long you will be laboring. We don't know how you will be like breathing through those contractions, right? And so there is a lot of pressure that can go on your pelvic floor one just from being pregnant for eight nine months or um but then also just when you go into labor so a lot of that looks the same but then we would kind of talk more about how you how you move after you have this c-section because it's a major abdominal surgery so we may tell you don't sit straight up when, once you lay down, don't go to sit straight up to get out of the bed, roll on your side like a log and sit up to protect that incision. And honestly, that would be the same for someone who delivered vaginally, because regardless of if they had a C-section, those abdominal muscles are weaker and more prone to just stay stretched out and you have the diastasis. So mm. that would be kind of the difference between the C-section preparing for birth for a C-section and delivery. But like I mentioned, any delivery is going to have some implications just based off the pregnancy. Um, and especially if that C-section is not a planned thing, able for a long time, um, be to do like an emergency. And there'll be a lot of implications on your pelvic floor, especially if you were kind of pushing the wrong way and putting way too much pressure um, on those muscles or tightening those muscles when you should be relaxing them. So really education, I guess, is really not that different. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, hearing like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing a theme. I'm hearing a theme, breathing, education. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm also thinking about... Um, for moms who do not come to see you, because you said that you recommend and you think that all mothers, all um, mothers who've had children can benefit and should see you or a pelvic floor therapist. But can there be adverse outcomes for moms who don't see a pelvic floor therapist? Yes. Um, <laughs> and it depends, you know, basically just like anything in healthcare, if there are some things that are going on that are acute and like we mentioned a lot of times things that are common end up being mistaken for normalities part of just because so much is changing but if we ignore it for so long that was super minor can become chronic and especially pain is so much easier to treat than it is later So if you want to want to just avoid that, if you could just go in to see a pelvic PT at least once for a screening and you get educated about what is common and what is normal. And then you know that when those things arise, you know where to go. Um, And it can just just decrease that lapse of care and it can help your time in PT be a lot shorter than it is when, you know, I see people for the first time who had three babies like five years ago 
and ignored all these things. And now they have to see me for much longer than someone who is postpartum and they had their baby like eight weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier, I want to go back to diastasis rectus. So Mm -hmm. that's basically where you have like a space in your rectus muscles, which are the two ab muscles, um, at the front of your stomach where your abs are. And a lot of pregnant women may experience that. Can Mm -hmm. you touch on some of the things that a woman can do when they work with a pelvic floor physical therapist or even on their own to help with that? Yeah. So the big one is what I mentioned earlier with the, how you get out of bed from the get go when you're in the hospital or at home or burden center, wherever you are, just gently roll to your side. You can even hug a pillow and press up with your arms versus kind of folding straight up and putting so much pressure on that fascia in between those muscles. So that tissue in between the muscles that are kind of still stretched out. Um, That's one major thing. Another one is definitely try not to lift so much after delivery when you can so having things in play and people around who can help you early on um and if you had seen a pelvic pt before delivery and you are more aware of your deep ab muscles being able to gently contract those muscles to kind of almost rewire things to kind of get things communicating again because these muscles were so spread out and the communication is different and so we're trying to get them to communicate and kind of merge back together so learning how to engage those deep abdominal muscles is huge and that's something you can do when you are making those transitional movements like rolling over or standing up Um, So that's a big thing as well. And just really learning how to gently increase your core strength, because that's the one thing that moms complain the most about is the appearance of their belly. And so they want to go straight into ab work and they may do too much too soon. And contrary to what people may think of what you may have seen online, it is not like contraindicated to do sit-ups or to do planks when you're postpartum. It's not, but Mm -hmm. it is if you can actually see like doming. So that's like the midline of your belly kind of poking out when you're doing those activities. Things should be able to kind of stay engaged, stay tight, stay flat with those activities. So if you see that bulge in the middle, then that means you shouldn't do it. So that could be sit-ups or crunches or planks, or it also could be um, squatting. You know, it just really depends on what your core system can maintain. Mm-hmm. It's so reassuring to hear from you that we don't have to bounce back so quickly as moms, because, you know, as you shared, you alluded to that there's just um, that a lot of moms are, we all, I think I was that mom that's, you know, self-conscious about your stomach after having a baby and mm-hmm. wanting to get back to working out and getting back to being active and doing it all right away. But what I'm hearing you say is that it's important to really take that time to heal and recover Mm -hmm. before jumping back into physical activity, lifting heavy things. And it's just great to hear because I know that if you're on social media, have some other images and, um, and messages that you're receiving, you might prioritize those over what is actually good, better for your body and your recovery. Yes. Oh my gosh. Do y'all follow Tia Mari? You know, TV yes. and Tamara. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I'm in love with her because <laughs> her postpartum recovery for her last child, she really took her time and she mm. like showed it to the world. And she just kind of really just debunked this whole like snapback culture. Yes. And I loved it so much. And she looks great. Yeah, she, she does. does. Yeah. yeah, you're you're right. She took her time. She did not just jump right back into it. Mm -mm, She did not. And I love her for it. I really do. (laughs) Okay. So another question I was going to ask was when people think of pelvic floor, they always are like, oh yeah, kegels. You know what I'm saying? They think kegels are the answer to everything, but is that not true that it's not the answer to everything? Like sometimes you can be too tight. Oh my gosh. And what's crazy is if you Google pelvic floor, anything, it's like the answer is always do kegels. But that is not true. Let's debunk that right here. Thank you. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're one with like pain with penetration or penetration is 
hard to even happen. Likely those muscles are too tight and you need to do some retraining of those muscles to help lengthen them. So to just increase um, the basically the space in your um, vaginal canal. So stop just doing Kegels because, and even if you have incontinence or so that's like leaking, sometimes Kegeling can be bad for that as well because some people leak and it's because their muscles are too tight, not just they're weak. So yeah. Stop it. Okay. So another question I have for you, because obviously there's a place for Kegels. How is a good Kegel done? Like I have a system in my head that I tell patients in the office. And I'm not going to say it just in case I'm saying it wrong, but how would you, <laughs> how do you direct patients to do it? Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. So you have, to, I'm a visual learner. So it's easy to explain for us visual learners. So imagine that your vagina and your anus are like elevator doors. So what you will want to do is to close those doors. So tighten those openings. And then you're going to want to lift. So think about closing the elevator doors and like going up to the first, the second floor. So it's not just enough just to close those openings because that's going to get first, second layer of your pelvic floor. But if you want to get that deep layer, the one that's really kind of helping fight prolapse, you have to do a lifting motion. So some folks say, think, think like you're picking up a marble with your vagina. (laughs) (laughs) And why would somebody need to do Kegels? They would need to do them if there is weakness and the tone of the muscles are okay. So if, so muscles can be tight and weak. And in those cases, usually we want to restore the length first. So make sure they're not tight first. And then we want to work on the strength. But if a muscle is long and weak, okay. Um, so you have the length, but it's weak. We can just go straight into strengthening. Hmm. And, and then when they think about my entire workout routine, <laughs> I to arms, legs, Kegels. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when you tell somebody to do Kegels, do you tell them to do like a certain number of reps and things like that? Yeah. Um, it depends because usually we, sometimes we want to work on fast contractions. So that kind of helps with that reflex that you need to not pee or poop when you like cough or sneeze, those quick movements. But then sometimes we need to work on endurance. So you might be holding a Kegel for longer um, if the endurance of the muscles are weaker. So a lot of times that's with prolapse. Um, So depending on what the issue is that will kind of determine just sets and reps and things like that. But a general rule of thumb is if let's say you're just doing a regular Kegel and you're holding for about two seconds. When you start to feel like your contraction is not as strong as the first rep, that's when you want to stop. So Mm -hmm. let's say that's after doing six of them. So you might want to do like three sets of six until you get to six and it's easy. And then you may want to go up to eight. Wow. Interesting. Okay. I have more questions. So let's talk about pain with sex after having a baby. The two most common types of pain that I see women have postpartum is dryness kind of pain and like a deep pelvic kind of pain. Now for women who may come and see you, how can they address that kind of pain after having a baby? Okay. So if it is deep pelvic pain, you Usually you kind of address the pelvic floor like layer by layer. So if the first layer is okay, the second layer is okay, but you said it's deep layer. Mm -hmm. It depends. So sometimes like pain can be just the sensation. So it's that type of pain, or it can be because of um, just muscle restrictions. So if it is restrictions in your muscles, and we find this out by doing that internal exam, Um, then we may use different tools like pelvic dilators if we need to kind of reach that deepest layer Um, or I may use my finger okay and just work on those individual muscles a lot of times it's just one muscle and if I work that muscle do some soft tissue work and just get it to release and relax they're fine 
Okay. Yeah. But um, women have, you know, that vaginal dryness with breastfeeding. And sometimes they need like topical estrogen or things mm-hmm. like that for their vulva to help. I love that this really shows that healing is more than what you see on the outside. And obviously there's the mental components of it, the emotional, but physically, even we're talking about the core, the pelvis, any kind of sensitive topics that a lot of us may not be wanting to talk about, whether it's leaking when we sneeze and laugh and all those things or pain with sex. Like these are issues that a lot of women may be experiencing and there's answers for it. Mm -hmm. So how can somebody find a pelvic floor physical therapist? Like where does one go? (laughs) So there are a lot of directories Um, and the one that I have is a link to on my Instagram is pelvicrehab.com and you can go there, put in your zip code and you can find just pelvic practitioners who were trained by the same um, organization I was trained by, Herman and Wallace. Um, so that's a big one. That's how you can just put your zip code in and you can just find one that's near you. Mm-hmm. That sounds so great and easy. I love that. And what about if somebody lives in the Atlanta area and wants to learn more about you and just visit your practice? How can folks find you? Yeah, so I am, I have a mother's practice. So what that means is I treat moms in decrease that access of care issue that we mentioned earlier and so you can find me and book a consultation with me on my website and that is generationalhealthptandwellness.com and my instagram is dr jt underscore the pelvic pt and that's drjt underscore the pelvic pt and that's where i put a lot of my educational stuff on there as well and there's like i said links to find a pt near you or to book a consultation with me um in my bio in my instagram that's perfect well ladies if you're in the atlanta area check her out check out her instagram and her website, reach out for a consultation. And we're just so glad that we were able to have this conversation with you today. I mean, it's so enlightening, even for us who are removed from being postpartum, we now have, gosh, soon to be a two-year-old for me. It's crazy. (laughs) You know, this is just so relevant. So I'm really happy to have this conversation today. And it seems like it can also be relevant for moms who have children who are not toddler and infants, but for just yeah. moms in general. So again, I, I echo what Renita said that this is so informative and enlightening. So thank you so much for visiting us. My pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a thing and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Instagram at the cradle and all or email us at the cradle and all at gmail.com. <laughs>